Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final episode, the season finale of the rise of RevOps, the modern sales pros and Salesforce lightning talks. I'm really, really excited about our conversation today. I I'd say this with all due respect to all of our other presenters. I think we've saved the best topic and the best speaker for last. Today, we're going to be talking about world class. We've talked about what the hell RevOps is and how we got here. We talked about how and why we use data as part of being world, you know, great RevOps people. We talked about how to hire people in RevOps. And now we're going to talk about really what does world class look like? And we've got one of the foremost minds with us today. We're joined and I'll give her a chance to introduce herself in a little bit. We've got Jenna Igartwa from Go Nimbly, the CEO of Go Nimbly, joining us yeah. today. And she's going to tell us and we're going to have a great conversation about what world class looks like. For a refresher for folks, our lightning talks are real quick. It's like a lightning strike, 30 minutes. Um, so we've got Jen for that time. Lots of questions hopefully coming in from the audience. Jen and I have a great conversation we're going to have, but really this is about you and getting what you need out of the conversation to figure out what world class looks like. Our sessions wouldn't be possible without the sponsorship of the team at Salesforce. Super, super grateful for their generous sponsorship to enable us to have these great conversations. And if you're enjoying our session here today and you're enjoying the conversation that Jen and I are having, I'd encourage you to join us at next month's Revenue Excellence Summit, where we'll be exploring a whole variety of topics, all focused on shifting your perspective and shifting your go-to-market strategy from function out to customer in. As Jen is going to talk about, silos and friction really, really do hurt your business. We're going to be talking about all things breaking down those silos, whether it's from a data perspective or whether it's through actually aligning sales, marketing, customer success, the humans, so you can generate some more revenue. Uh, but with that, enough about modern sales, enough about the stuff we've got coming up. I'd love to hand it over to Jen Agartwa to share a little bit about her background. Not only is she the CEO of Go Nimbly, she is an aspiring improv comic, and she has actually produced her own uh, card game. So I think it's the first time we've had somebody, such a renaissance woman on uh, modern sales. But, uh -huh. but Jen, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience, and then we can jump into to some of our conversation today. I think I'm going to change my LinkedIn to be Renaissance woman. I've Renaissance. never been called that. It's so amazing. Um, I've actually made two games, Richard, side oh. effects and mud. Um, we just got picked up by Barnes and Noble for side effects. Ooh. So I uh, didn't know they were still a store, uh, but that's cool. I don't think um, that you should say that right after they just picked you up. I think that that may be. Yeah, no, you're right. Love them. You should go check them out. That's great. Uh, you should go to Barnes and Noble. They've got a Starbucks store. in the two of them that are still there. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, so like Richard said, I am CEO of Go Nimbly. So a little bit about how I got here. I actually started my career as a technologist. I was an Eloqua consultant, Marketo consultant, really obsessed with marketing operations. And there was a kind of a shift that happened, I'd say like a couple of years into my career where I got really interested in how sales teams and marketing teams have the most friction. And it seemed really silly to me because they were so aligned. Like you would expect more friction between like a finance team and a marketing team because, right. you know, you're fighting for budget. But actually these two teams want the same thing. They want to produce revenue. But like we have a million memes about sales and marketing alignment. Uh, and so I found that really, other. yeah. I found that really curious. So I started doing kind of alignment workshops and, and really getting more into trying to align those two teams. And when we started Go Nimbly, really the, the focus, like our tagline before revenue operations was a thing, uh, we called it unifying the business stack. So we were still like pretty focused in the technology space. And it was all about, hey, we need to think about our technology stack as one. And we can't be thinking that like one team owns one thing, one team owns another. And that kind of elevated and morphed into what revenue operations is today. And that's, you know, we work with SaaS companies to really stand that up, be that revenue operations team. And like we said, up level them to be world-class revenue operators. Exciting. And, and for somebody who's been in the space since the beginning, um, thank you for first introducing yourself and congratulations on the second game. We didn't know that you had that. So that's awesome. <laughs> but one of, one of the things, Jen, before we jump into talking about what world class looks like, I think revenue operations can be a little bit of a loaded term, sure. depending on who you talk to, it means different things. Maybe baseline us a little bit in, from your perspective and your yeah. language, what the hell is revenue operations? Good question. So I think at the baseline, it's it's a methodology 
Um, that's all it is. And I actually did an exercise with my leadership team and I was like, why does GoNimbly exist? Like we can talk about revenue operations as honestly a solution, but like, what's the problem that we're solving? And uh, you're going to have to excuse my French, but um, I speak French very, very well. So I'm going to go ahead and do it, which is um, don't let your internal bullshit get in the way of the customer experience. That's what we kind of like try yeah. to dwindle it down. And revenue operations right now for me is a solution to help with that internal bullshit, which comes out in silos, teams not yep. talking, not prioritizing the right work, uh, creating a shitty customer experience just because so-and-so didn't have the right information at the time when they interacted with your customer. Or, or so, those, those two groups don't talk. So there's right. no way I knew that that thing happened. Right, right. right. And it's, it can be really like, it can be technology silos. It can be people silos. It can be data silos. It could be from two teams not talking to each other because they don't have the muscle to do it. Or it can be an AE doesn't have access to product data. So they couldn't talk to the problem that the customer had when they were doing an upsell. Like it can show up in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And for us right now, like go nimbly will still exist if revenue operations is implemented lovely at every company forever, because they'll still be bullshit. We'll figure out the next thing that needs to happen. And in this methodology, what it is, is you've got your revenue team and that includes go-to-market and operations. So for me, our go-to-market are our AEs, our campaign managers, our CS reps, everybody that's talking to the customer, that's our go-to-market team. And then our operators, our RevOps team are our operators and their job or why we implement RevOps is to unify those teams that are kind of naturally siloed. So it's bringing that together so that we can remove that bullshit uh, and make more impact. Equal parts, equal parts, group therapy, uh, and lots of lots of technology alignment there too. Yeah. Well, th thank you, thank you for sharing that. I think that sets a good baseline for us, and and you're uniquely positioned to answer this broad topic that we want to hit on today. Yeah. What what does world class revenue Oof. operations? What does that look like? Yeah. And and I mean, let's just start there, and and let's jump into it because I think. Oh. There's a lot of folks that, and it reminds me a little bit of big data about a decade ago, right? Everybody's doing big data and everyone's like, well, what are you, how are you, how are you doing big data? So right. what does world-class RevOps look like uh, from, from yeah. your perspective? Totally. So the, it's really a maturity map, right? When we, when we go into companies and we dive in and we try to figure out, okay, where are you at in your maturity as a revenue operations team? There's a lot of things that we look for, for somebody being on the journey, right? And it is basically an investment. It's a, it's a system that needs to be managed. And so there's never like, you're done. But the things that I look for there is like, one, are you able to prioritize the right work? Like, how do you prioritize work? Is it on behalf of the revenue and the customer? How influenced are you by the loudest person in the, in the room? How influenced are you by fires? Uh, like what percentage of your work is unplanned? And I guess like a really big thing to look for is like, do you have a roadmap? Are you intentional about your work? I would say like, that's sort of the, the biggest thing. It's a, it's a belief that I have, which is if you're not doing the right work, you're like not making the most impact. So that's like number one, the first thing that I look for. In, in terms of this too, I think there's, there's a lot to unpack there. There's this, this reactive versus proactive, mm -hmm. right? I think totally. sometimes revenue operations can feel like the place where that's just a dumping ground for the complex sure. projects that kind of live in a gray area. Yeah. How does that factor into like world-classness? Yeah, I mean, it's still the work, right? And so yes. the way that I like to think about, um, if I look at any team, and this is not just RevOps, this is any team, you're going to have the machine that you need to run. And that's going to include reactive things. That's going to include like anything that you do monthly, uh, your commissions, uh, campaigns that are running, like anything that, that just needs to happen, that's your machine. And then there's kind of the innovation which is like, how are you making that machine better? How are you up leveling? How are you making more impact? And you want a really good balance of those two things. If you're sitting there and doing like a ton of reactive, you're gonna have to figure out why that's happening. It could be, you just don't have enough like strategy muscle on your team. It could be that you're not intentional. You're not prioritizing the right stuff or you've got like a ton of tech debt and you really need to fix that. And it's just creating a ton of noise for you. Uh, figure out like what one of those things are. Maybe you're understaffed. Like there's a ton of reasons why that's happening, but you got to find a good balance to be able to do like innovative, intentional work versus like the machine. No, I like that idea of, of tech debt, but I, I feel like RevOps sometimes too ends up handling uh, some of what I would call business debt. 
you know, things that aren't like the tech stack, but maybe opportunity definitions are misaligned and all of that. That, that yeah. plays an important part here too, yeah. right? Kind of overcoming some of that business debt. Yeah. And I would, I would probably put that in the bucket of innovation. Like if yeah. I'm coming into a team and saying like, we need to redo your, like when you create an opportunity and what the stages are and, you know, your renewal process and all that, like, I would call that innovation. You're probably up leveling as a business. You've hit a new inflection point and we need to get you, you know, a business process that works for you. I would put that like really in that, Hey, you're doing the right proactive work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one too. And folks, we've, we've talked about this a lot in modern sales and Jen, it's, it's no surprise, right? Those stages, having clear definitions, those are sound yeah. really easy, but sometimes if you've got a dozen reps and they create opportunities at different times and they move them to different stages at different points, it's, it's really hard to get the data to run totally. your business. Um, when, yeah. when, you, when you think about this, the silo syndrome, right? That's something where mm -hmm. I think revenue operations plays an important role of sure. breaking down those yeah. silos. How do you start to prioritize some of the silos to break down? Because in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any, but how do you think of prioritization in this world-class revenue ops model? Yeah. So I guess the first thing is how do you identify those silos? If I can re-ask your question. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's a, a bunch Real of things move. that, yeah, you're going to have to look for, for some symptoms and figure out which kind of silo you've got. The really curious thing is the places where you see the most silo syndrome and the most pain are the high growth companies that are successful. Um, so it's really curious. It's one of the reasons we're focused on SaaS and high growth is because that's where these problems arise. Is it's like tons of new employees, uh, new departments forming, lots of KPIs that are different. Um, you look for um, like basically growth and that's gonna create more silos because people naturally want sort of a smaller space. And what you find is teams actually work really well vertically, just not well horizontally. Yeah. It's like, it's not hard to align when you are all sort of in the same vertical. Well, so crashes, we're going to look for, yeah, we're going to yeah, look for some of those. At the intersections, right? That's what we've said That's a right. lot. Yeah. And so we're going to look for, okay, how's it showing up? Like, why, why did it happen? Like, is this because you've just had a ton of new employees, like lots of new change? Then there's a lot of different symptoms. You might find um, like a like knowledge hoarding, data hoarding, like information hoarding is like a big thing. Like one team has access to it. It might not be malicious, but it's like, I don't have access to that. I'm not sharing that. So like, we'll look for that. A lot of team-based identities. So like my marketing team, like my process, my leads, like we're going to look for some of that. So you kind of have to figure out like, where is it showing up and where is the pain? And mm -hmm. then we can, you know, try to knock that down. Well, and, and sometimes that can manifest itself in really ugly ways to the customer, right? Like if we've totally. got all this internal friction. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we're prioritizing gaps, that's what we kind of call it. Like we're going to come in, we'll do some assessments with your team, try to find out where the silo syndrome is showing up. And we talk a lot about people silos, but it's also data and technology silos. What, what's keeping us from creating a great customer experience? Ideally, a great RevOps team, this is again world-class, is going to prioritize the biggest gaps to revenue and customer experience. And so can you actually be talking about gaps, not projects? So I talked about having a roadmap. The other thing that I'm going to look for if you are prioritizing work, are you prioritizing like, yeah, we're implementing sales loft this you know, quarter, or we need CPQ, or uh, we need a new MQL definition. Like, okay, those are projects and initiatives, but does it roll up to an actual gap? Like, how did you get there? And so we really, what I want to see a, a great team come to me and say, hey, we found that we were losing, you know, most of our deals at stage three, which is where we do proposals because our reps can't figure out pricing in an easy way. That's why we're prioritizing CPQ because our, like, that's where we're losing our data says it. And our customers say we're super slow at pricing. Like, oh, cool. That sounds like the right Thing. That's not just intuition telling you to do a certain project. You're doing it with a why. And so we're going to look for that as well. Well, and I think that that's, that's actually a unique perspective that you're bringing here as you talk about kind of world-class revenue operations. There is an element of customer empathy or customer sure. focus with this. It's not just a back of the house kind of assembly right. line position. Yeah. I mean, we want to give operators, you know, I know this is so cliche and I hate myself for even saying it, but like a seat at the table, oh. um, I guess a, an invite to the Zoom meeting. I, <laughs> I, I hate that so much. I hate myself for saying it, but that's like, how is, does this become a strategic function? And it's not by just execution, right? Execution is important. 
but it's because you're the ones guiding the prioritization of what your company spends time on. And I think I think that another way to say that that we've heard on um, I think it was Daniel Marquis from Zappi, the VP of sure. Revenue Operations. He was like, "Look, we've got a lot of data, and it's revenue operations job to 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 keep that seat at the table by turning that data into information and prioritization yes, yes. and action. It's not enough just to have the chart. It's like, what the heck right. do you do with it? What are you doing? Yeah, are you benchmarking yourself like against yourself? Are you benchmarking against your industry? Does it you know create like?" What I want a team to be doing is looking retroactively at their data and saying, we got a problem here, here, and here. And here's like the work that we're doing to fix those things. Like that to me would be like a big check mark that you're doing it right. Well, and, and I feel like the, the roadmap is such an important part of, of what we're talking about here. One, one thing too, I'm always curious about as we think about revenue operations, it's, it's got a unique role to play in, in compensation is as sure. well how do you see that in in world class organizations right how do you see the relationship between rev ops maybe finance and and other groups as they're designing compensation which is a really tricky part of the process yeah honestly i i don't think that i've got the answer yet for that um i think that that's you know we started with this rev ops journey on bringing uh marketing sales and customer success and then very like quickly it's like well what about product and what about finance and where do they sit and so now we have to figure out like where is that line because yeah. finance actually plays a really important checks and balance like function and it is like you know uh basically a, a an important function almost to be siloed and so that brings this like idea of what does it mean to have intentional silos in your organization um and so i'm, I'm still like working through that um and trying to figure out like what what role does finance play? Like, are they just a partner? Are they, you know, are they like an advisor when you're coming up with these plans? Um, are they an approver? Like, sure. Like, where's the authority lie? Yeah, it's it's really tricky, right? Because you want to design a, a really enticing compensation model for your sure. for your revenue folks, but you also, you know, you have an operating plan for the business, and and totally. it's it's almost like there needs to be some healthy tension there. In, yeah. in a good way, right? Not in a malicious way, but some healthy tension sure. gets the business to where it needs to go. Yeah, absolutely. So one, one of the other things too, is we think about, you know, the evolution of revenue operations that didn't happen in a silo. Product-led growth has also started to become more and more of a focus area for some organizations. Is, is you think about the evolving role of revenue operations, where does you know products and products data kind of fit into the the overall framework of, of a world class organization? Yeah, so I would kind of put that squarely in that sort of like data silo tech silo work. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that you look for in a, in like inflection points and in a maturity of of a business. And what do they have from an infrastructure perspective? Like, are they built to scale? And, you know, for SaaS companies, having product integrated with your Salesforce or wherever your CRM is, uh, it's probably Salesforce if you're in the SaaS space. Um, does that live? Is that accessible? What's the integration? Like where, you know, we have clients that are still closed one opportunity and like the AE goes into product and creates a user, you know, and, and how do we automate that flow? Um, like one, so we're not manually creating users. And then two, how are you like, I don't know, here's the concept of PQLs. How are you product, like prioritizing product qualified leads, especially in usage-based and self-serve companies so that you know, hey, this is an important lead. We had a, a company that had a self-serve model. Their biggest customer was spending tons of money on their own without any help from an, like a rep. And it took a while to identify, hey, who's talking to this customer? Uh, and like, what's the plan to level them up? And, you know, a big part of that is you could have an infrastructure that lifts up PQLs and, and tells your rep what to do next. It feels like it feels like that's kind of the next. There may be two areas that I that we've had conversations about in, in these lightning talks that kind of represent the future horizon mm -hmm. for revenue. One is that product for usage sure. data integration, because totally. it's really tricky. And, and, and Jen, I, I'd be curious to hear your perspective. What percentage of orgs actually have that figured out? I mean, literally every single one of our customers gets there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, get like every SaaS company at some point is going to be, bring product data into Salesforce and start elevating opportunities and actions from that data, whether it's auto creating opportunities when certain thresholds happen or alerts being sent 
like everybody will get there in, in a, like a maturity of that company. How quickly you do that, you know, depends on your investment in operations, essentially. Yeah. It also feels like the the folks that are maybe going to get a leg up on the competition are going to figure that out sooner rather than later. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, how it's it's so it's so integral to this type of business because right. it's all about renewals and upsells. And how do you do that if you don't have access to what your customers are doing in product? So um, it's happening. It's been happening. Uh, it's just getting a lot more talk time now. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely playing up, and that and that kind of leads me to the the second point. It does feel like uh, uh, many folks in the modern sales pros community, and and you know even probably some folks that are on today, started out in in sales operations and evolved their roles into revenue ops. So I think a lot of folks get the sales and marketing pieces of revenue ops, but it feels like another area on the horizon is really like supporting customer yeah. success to this point. Sure. And it feels like there's some green field there. Um, what are some yeah. of the the thought leaders or folks that you're working with kind of doing to support customer success as much as they are sales and marketing? It's, it's still early there. Like, you know, there's, that's the part of sale we have. Like that's the, the least amount of budget in operations is under CS still. Really? Um, yeah, which is crazy, but yeah, I mean, can you guess what the highest is? Sales and marketing. I would, that, that's it's what sales. I would guess. Sales over marketing. Yeah. Um, marketing gets more cash, but operationally less. Um, so typically it's your kind of sales team that have, and I don't think this is fair, but they have the easiest back of the napkin math. If we do this, it makes this much money. Um, they have the easiest time making that case. So they get the biggest amount of money. Um, even though we all know that retention is important. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean it's it's as it's as important, and I don't want to I don't want to go too far ahead and, and make everybody that's at a venture backed SaaS company grumpy, but like it's as important if you get revenue in the door, if you can't retain it, it, who cares? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, your your multiple, and I, I Jen, you know this right? Your multiple comes in a lot of instances from what's your net retention? Is it one? It's your oh, CAC. Six? Is it one LTV fifth? ratio? That's yeah. it, right? Exactly. So it includes marketing, sales, customer success. If there's if there's nothing more that tells you that your revenue team needs to be aligned is the fact that when you go get investment, they look at that number. So you need to know how much it takes to acquire, which is sales and marketing, and how much it takes to retain, which is your LTV. So there's your metric. Uh, yeah, that's and that's that's kind of what, and I think world class really, really supports that. Yeah. Um, we're, we're winding down on time here. No, no surprise, these lightning talks go by really, really quickly. Is is it fair to kind of think of world class revenue operations in some ways, like you think of a world class product organization, right? Where there's yeah. like a roadmap and all of that. Like, how how should we think about this? Totally. And, yeah, I love that actually. I've said before, like you wouldn't trust a product team without a roadmap. Why do we trust an operations team without one? Um, and that like goes even further. I ask a lot of operators, like, when's the last time you spoke to one of your customers? Uh, and you get crickets, right? And it's like, well, you're here protecting the customer experience, go talk to them. Um, and it's the same thing for a product team. You wouldn't trust a product team that has never spoken to one of their customers. And, you know, and then I would say the last like sort of pillar that, that has a lot of, of synergy. And I hadn't actually thought about this till now, but we also talk a lot about doing durability tests like being proactive, put yourself in the customer's shoes, like test, stress test your organization. So things like, when's the last time you secret shopped your team? How are you doing, you know, rep rides? Uh, like what known unknowns, like we do a lot of like customer mapping and all of a sudden I'll be like, well, how does this happen? And the room will be like, oh, we're not sure. Like how often are you going into those black boxes and, and like really understanding what's happening? And like, I believe a, a world-class revenue team is doing that monthly like you're always stress testing your organization that's a really interesting point i think we we haven't heard that and i, I think it's, it's something new that has come up in the community as well how, what would that actually look like would you say it's monthly to secret shop or we try <laughs> yeah our we want to do and and it wouldn't be secret shopping always it's right. like how do you create the muscle on your team to be proactively trying to find gaps that's all it is like how are you proactively trying to figure out what's not showing up in your data yet? Like it's easy to pull your funnel metrics and be like, we have a problem here, but like, can you get ahead of the next problem? I'm, I'm curious because you probably get this question a lot. How do you, how do you actually kind of think about the ROI for that? 
right? Because identifying an unknown. I hate ROI. I'm, I'm just well, I'm just saying, right? We've only got like we know we know operations yeah. is is straps tight, and they're fighting. The, there's probably eight thousand projects and two yeah. things to work on. How do you justify that when you're pitching? Hey, we got to do a customer yeah. journey map and explore some black boxes. What's the what's the sale? Yeah, so we actually don't have a difficult time with that sort of ROI. I think it's more on the work stream. So, cause that's not actually very expensive. Like a durability test might take you 10 hours. Like it's, we're not, we don't need to do like a big ROI statement on that. But I think the, the like real value is that we're going to prioritize again, the right work with that's going to be the most impactful. So me uncovering your gaps, isn't making you any money. Me then prioritizing that gap above anything else that's going to increase that LTV of your customer like, and the data shows that you're going to increase your, your customer. If you like really think about RevOps holistically, you're going to make 20% more LTV per customer if you really invest in operations. And so like, that's, that's essentially your ROI. What we say is revenue impact. We want to say like, how much more money can we make you? Um, and we benchmark work streams, right? So like, I'll look at a work stream and I'll say, Hey, we started this on August 1st and we were looking at volume at MQL. We were going to increase MQL volume. And we benchmark that and look at it, you know, three months later after implementation. And that's what we can see, like back in the napkin math, how much revenue that created. Uh, we also always look at conversion value and a missing one velocity to make sure it didn't decrease those. And sometimes right. it does, right? I can increase the volume and then decrease the conversion and I didn't make you much money there. Um, so we look at all those metrics and just make sure that we're still moving in the right direction. Which, which comes back to some of the innovation projects. We're making sure you're aligned on what the heck an MQL right. or a PQL is, when to create an opportunity and all that. Um, Jen, we've only got a couple of minutes left. One last question for you. What's what's the future hold for revenue operations? What is, we're having this conversation five or 10 years from now. What's different? What's the same? What's the future hold for revenue operations? No so, pressure, uh, no pressure. This is going to live on uh, forever on YouTube too. So just. Um, that's a big, bold question. I think it would like, this is sort of what I was alluding to at the beginning of, of our conversation. I, I think what I would see in the industry above, like where is revenue operations, like how are companies operating is like the continuation of aligning your teams against customer experience and revenue. I don't think that's going away. No. Uh, and we've been talking about putting the customer first for a long time. I think that the movement in, in B2B is enough innovation like B2C companies have. You know, like how do we compare ourselves to creating an experience like Amazon does for us? Um, and, you know, like I want to start to see more innovation in the way that we interact and show up to our customers where they are. Uh, and that that solution, again, is like revenue operations being one part of it. Uh, right. But it will be it will be other things. It will be technology. It will be like the way that we prioritize. It will be like how we focus and how we interact with each other. I think that there's a lot of innovation in how we work. Yeah, I, I, I love that point. I think it's something um, Brian Halligan had said to the consumerization of the enterprise sure. B2B buyer, right? Like we're buying cars and mattresses online right now, sight right. unseen. Why do right. I have to talk to a human to buy a $10,000 piece of software? It seems yeah. really silly. And, and I love it. And in 10 years, we're going to look back on that and go, man, what were we, what were we thinking? Yeah. We were doing the best we can with what we got, but right. now there's so much technology and tooling to do it. Yeah. Anytime that we're frustrated buying, like anytime that you're feeling like, oh my God, why do I have to talk to this? Like, okay, I'm going through the SDR motion and now I'm talking to the AE and then we're going to negotiate. Like all that, that feels like friction and shitty. Yeah. Like it's about removing that. I, I think the best that we heard, we had on uh, Tiffany Bova from Salesforce. And she was like, you don't wake up in the morning and say, Jen, today's the day. I'm, I'm going to be a stage four opportunity. I can feel That's it. That's right. <laughs> like, it's so silly. It's so quaint. Yeah. <laughs> but Jen, I, look, I, congr by the way, congratulations on Thank everything. You. Congratulations on the, uh, the elevation of your role at Go Nimbly. It's Appreciate awesome. It. And it's been great to have you on here. I know you're super, super busy. So thank you for joining us for the season finale of our- The headliner. Like, you're the headliner. This it's was so this was really awesome. Appreciate <laughs> appreciate you yeah. sharing your perspective here. And um, this went by so I can't believe we're done. <laughs> Me too. But thank you, thank you so much for everything here. And folks, uh, season two, we're going to be talking all about data driven 
team and individual management, and that's going to be in September. So stay tuned for that. Some more amazing guest speakers. But with that, Jen, thank you for taking us home on our final episode. Stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day. You're the best. Take care. Bye-bye.